Thank you so much, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I wanna just say it's about, I don't know, 5 a.m. or something on my body. It's real early uh, coming from LA, but I'm just uh, thrilled to be here with you. I usually give this talk in the afternoon, just somehow it works out that way, and it's, it's really a talk that's um, best followed by cocktails. So I can't do anything about that this morning for you. I was um, sharing with um, Sarah and Antoinette that it's, uh, it's a little early to dive into oppression on the internet, but we're gonna go ahead and meander through. I uh, have just finished writing a book about, it's entitled Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and it's about the ways in which technology is designed kind of without uh, particular attention to its effects on people who are already experiencing marginalization in society. And so I'll share a little bit um, with you about that, but I thought um, instead of focusing entirely on the subject of the book that I might also um, share with you some research that, that I've done with a colleague, uh, Sarah Roberts, also at UCLA, about um, the ways in which technologies fail and um, a, a different perspective on their failure. So some of you might be really familiar with the kinds of things that I'm gonna be talking about. And I know that you're, uh, you're designers and developers and programmers and so, um, you might not be thinking about these kinds of failures in sociological terms, right, in terms of their impact on uh, And that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today is really technology in a social context from the perspective of people who are m more likely to be harmed with those technologies. So let's get in. The first failure I wanna talk about is the failure of Google Glass which I know is back in the lab, and, uh, uh, and we'll see how it um, reemerges. But in April of 2014, the research firm Toluna reported that 72% of the public hated Google Glass. The Google Glass is a wearable information assistant technology, and people really um, despised it due to the privacy concerns um, uh, based on its capacity for surveillance. Multiple reports of Google Glass wearers being attacked for wearing the technology in public have made headlines across the United States <clears throat> since Google first launched its exploratory beta to select users in spring of 2013. Google Glass, as you know, is a head-mounted wearable optical technology that promised users to, quote, take pictures, record what you see, hands free Share what you see live, obtain directions, send messages, and ask whatever is on your mind. With a series of Google and third-party applications, Google Glass promised to be a technology that would allow the wearer to scan images and people in the user's line of sight and, quote, Google them using the massive data power of Google search engine to provide more information to the wearer about objects and people captured in the Google Glass gaze. Google marketed it as a tool of freedom with a powerful video depicting a series of experiences that can be captured hands-free to foster a greater sense of participation and power over one's informational and geospatial environment than one can experience by simply holding a smartphone. But what is Google Glass and why does it engender such emotion among those who both love and hate the technology? So this morning, I really want to discuss the implications of large-scale multinational platforms, namely Google, and some of its failures from wearable technologies like Google Glass that function as a tool for occupying, commodifying, and profiting from the biological, psychological, and emotional, emotional data of its wearers, and critically, from those who fall within I want to offer up Glass as one of two case studies this morning that we can learn from through its first round of failure and also look at search today in an attempt to educate you about the many ways that we need to think more critically about the products and projects we are so rapidly embracing. Now Google Glass arrived at a time when Google, headquartered in Mountain View, California, had already incited people 
feeling the economic and emotional ramifications of the changing landscape of the San Francisco Bay Area as the latest tech boom has pushed people out of affordable housing via evictions. Landlords across California, but particularly in San Francisco, and now we're starting to experience this in Silicon Beach in Los Angeles, uh, have taken great advantage of the Ellis Act during the most recent tech, techno boom in housing, which allows them to clear all ten tenants out of their multiple unit dwellings, often rent controlled, by claiming that the landlord is, quote, going out of business. That's what the Ellis Act allows for. Now this disposition maps onto the current processes of radical gentrification and displacement in many San Francisco neighborhoods and signals that power, whiteness, and class elitism are core values in the Google Glass design imaginary. Glass's recognizable aesthetic and outward facing camera um, has elicited intense emotional response, particularly when exploration has taken place in the areas of San Francisco occupied by residents who are finding themselves priced out or evicted from their homes to make way for the techno elite. The strategy is typically used to convert apartment buildings um, and high-priced condominiums. Uh, 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 and these practices have made new and existing um, unaffor uh, housing unaffordable for those residents not employed in high-paying sectors such as the tech industries or finance. Indeed, Newsweek reported that in 2005, after new technology companies like Google began attracting thousands of high-paid employees to the Bay, the number of Ellis evictions tripled. In 2013, Ellis evictions grew 175% from the year before. Now, Google in particular has received special ire, not only because of perceptions of its presence being responsible for Ellis evictions, but also due to its ubiquitous fleet of luxury buses and their impact on life in the Bay Area. These coaches move San Franciscans who labor at its Mountain View corporate headquarters to and fro every day in private Wi-Fi enabled air conditioned comfort. According to the master's thesis of city planner Alexandra Goldman, rents at apartments near Google bus stops rose 20% during a period where the average rent increase was 5%. Included in her evidence were Craigslist ads denoting the presence of the Google bus stops as a perk for apartments located nearby. Apple, eBay, Twitter, Electronic Arts, Facebook, and Yahoo, among others, also run private bus lines which have been protested by local residents. Indeed, Google and many high-tech companies in Silicon Valley have directly contributed to gentrification in previously multiracial neighborhoods in San Francisco and throughout the Bay Area. A challenge of gentrification is that it brings new wine bars, vape shops, restaurants, and boutiques to areas that might previously have not had such high-end amenities. But gentrification has always been a narrative of improvement that draws upon a mystique of transforming previously uninhabitable places into spaces that can be occupied. Like colonial projects of the past that seek an expansion into new territories and locales, despite there already being inhabitants of those spaces, gentrification is hailed as offering an improvement or reinvestment into neighborhoods that when occupied by low-income people of color were seen as not valuable or necessarily productive. As San Francisco is overrun with tech workers, the majority of whom are white and Asian men with lucrative salaries and stock options, the city is experiencing hypergentrification, a term coined by policy analysts who watched the millionaires produced at local tech giant Twitter buy up all the middle income housing, displacing urban residents. While the private coach services do not offer uh, do offer reduced greenhouse gas emissions versus all 4,500 riders taking private vehicles. They have also monopolized local public transit bus stops in the Muni system, which is our kind of local uh, train uh, public transit system, without remuneration to the city, and are part of a series of other notorious soft benefits at Google that appear egregious to those who do not work in similar tech industry settings. In short, the Google bus and the Google employees at ferries back and forth to Silicon Valley have become highly visible symbols of class division in San Francisco. In response, locals have gone so far as to block buses from moving or stopping for pickups and smashing bus windows. Google Glass 
has a fundamental design flaw in that, it is, in that its logic, while likely unintended, privileges an imaginary of whiteness and unbridled exploration and intrusion into, into the physical and emotional space of others. And the dominant narrative as Google Glass, as events through its marketing strategy, posits its wearers as explorers, a familiar colonial narrative. So here you have a picture of what we think of as typical kind of colon, a typical colonizer um, on the right. And then you have um, pictures of residents of San Francisco who are warning tech companies that they cannot take over the public infrastructure and use it um, at their will. Um, many times to the detriment of public buses who are trying to stop in those spaces who can't because private coaches are using their stops. Now, utopian discourses of freedom through technology are not new. Critical geography scholars have written extensively about how hierarchies of power are reproduced and enacted through digital technologies, and they point to the ways in which <clears throat> the informationalization and digitization of everyday life heightens control and surveillance, but also establishes digital enclosures with power-laden boundaries across race, gender, and class. Technological projects are never neutral, and Google Glass is not a tool of freedom despite its marketing discourse. Indeed, the most controversial aspect of Google Glass um, was its outward-facing camera, allowing users to record things within their field of vision, which the camera then follows. Concerns have ranged from the potential theft of ATM passcodes by passers-by wearing glass to the illegal infringements of glass wearers recording copyrighted material in movie theaters or the potential for cheating in Las Vegas casinos, which have, of course, banned wearers. I don't know why I didn't think of the wearing that in Vegas. I mean, that actually was a great idea. Video resulting from all of these potential uses of the technology could easily be uploaded real time or streamed to the internet to be circulated, stored, and owned by glass wearers, all without the consent of anyone within the Google Glass gaze. Consistently, critics and news reports have largely leveled critiques at the product as an important site of the fight to resist the hyper-surveillance um, that is an everyday people, providing seemingly, providing seemingly free services that improve the quality of our lives while asking for nothing in return. Jay McGregor, writing for Forbes.com, said, quote, Google has suffered an image problem since it was accused of providing a backdoor to the National Security Administration in Snowden's documents. Um, the real-life contradictions, like se selling the public out to the NSA or gentrifying low-income neighborhoods of color, are where the imaginary of Google's utopian benevolence are made most apparent. Likewise, Google Glass occupies a similarly visible and elitist cultural space, made available only through a limited beta program afforded to the wealthy and connected. While other Google products function, uh, functions of data mining and usage tracking are undertaken on an individual user basis, for example, in one's own Gmail account, Google Glass is the visible manifestation of Google's tracking turned outward onto others, just as Google buses are an outward demonstration of neighborhood occupation and urban colonization. In a rapidly gentrifying and increasingly economically stratified San Francisco, people have reacted with anger and insecurity when finding themselves the unwilling targets of Google Glass's gaze. In this context, the, Google, the glasswares have been received in San Francisco and cities like it, not only as glass holes, but also people are referring to glass wearers as class holes. And this has gone on to a campaign to slowly regain the public's trust in carefully managed uh, bursts. And so here you have um, um, a campaign that was launched uh, to help uh, restaurant owners in Seattle and, and other kind of tech corridors um, where they were posting stickers um, banning the wearing of Google Glass and these kinds of um, projects have really uh, taken off. And so this to me is a really different way of thinking about Google Glass as a failure. And it's certainly not the typical way that people um, in Silicon Valley think of Google Glass as a technological failure. 
but you, we can see that there are many dimensions of the ways in which um, technology is designed without a particular concern or care for many of the uh, attendant communities that for which it may not even be uh, designed. So I want to tell you now, I want to present uh, case study number two. And this is um, also uh, a, an example, I'm going to give you a series of examples of maybe some unintended consequences from Google search. <clears throat> On October 21st, 2013, the United Nations launched a campaign directed by Mimak Ogilvy and Mather Dubai using, quote, genuine Google searches to bring critical attention to the sexist and discriminatory ways in which women are regarded and denied human rights. Over the mouths of various women of color were the auto suggests that reflected the most popular searches that take place in Google search. So when they collected and when they started to type women cannot, Google auto suggests filled in, women cannot drive, be bishops, be trusted, speak in church, uh, women shouldn't have rights, vote, work, box, Women should stay at home, be slaves, be in the kitchen, not speak in church. Women need to be put in their places, know their place, be controlled, be disciplined. Christopher Hunt, the art director of the campaign, said, quote, when we came across these searches, we were shocked by how negative they were and we decided we had to do something with them. Now what the campaign determined to show how the ads are shocking because they show just how far we still have to go to achieve gender equality. They are a wake-up call and we hope that the message will travel far, knowing that Sonia Shakibar, a copywriter for the campaign, who was quoted on the United Nations website. Now, the campaign was reflective of our common understanding and beliefs about search engine results, that they credibly reflect the realities and truths of how users of search engines feel. They demonstrate the way the public generally think of search, that search simply reflects what is most popular. But I want to unpack this a little bit and um, really this, this unpacking is something that I um, focus the entire book um, that's forthcoming on. Um, because there's more to uh, Google search results as probably everyone in this room knows beyond simply um, what is most popular rising to the top. Um, I've been collecting searches for many years and what I found is that it's opened up a Pandora's box of many important issues that I'm taking up along with other kind of um, critical information scholars um, about the power issues that are uh, embedded in these technologies that I think we need to address. And I would say that I'm probably um, particularly concerned and maybe obsessed with the implications of search because it's constantly evolving and shifting over time and it now occupies the most meaningful engagements with the web and information seeking. I'm an information studies um, professor so I'm very interested in the intersection of the web and the internet and that can be helpful for me in terms of where we need to drive this. Libraries being replaced. Libraries being replaced with Google search, um, teachers being over reliant upon sending their students to the web to just Google it um, uh, to find answers rather than looking for other types of information in other types of contexts. So the goal of the exploration that we're gonna go on now is really not only about why we get troublesome search results, but it's also designed to help us think about whether it truly makes sense to outsource all of our knowledge needs to commercial search engines, particularly at a time when the public is increasingly reliant upon search engines in lieu of libraries, librarians, teachers, and other knowledge keepers and resources. I believe we need to move into a state of hypervigilance about digital technologies, and we might even find ourselves collectively helpless to the market, force, uh, the market forces of hypercapitalism that are driving us to faster and deeper investments in digital technologies and big data paradigms when what we might need is a slower, more nuanced, and critical ap approach to buttress our humanity. I'm suggesting, in fact, that we have more technology than ever and more global and social inequality to match it. And I think we're in a crisis of consciousness that our fields are typically, uh, are uniquely positioned to elevate uh, uh, and, and we should. Now, <clears throat> over the years, I've concentrated my research on unveiling many ways that black and African American people have been contained and constrained in classification systems like Google's search engine, but I also study library databases, for example. Um, 
And, and um, Google's search engine was really uh, born from citation analysis metrics in library and information science. And so this is, to me is why it's a fascinating topic. Um, I'm thinking about these issues through the lenses of critical information studies, critical race, and gender studies. As marketing and advertising has directly shaped the ways that marginalized people have come to be represented by digital records like search results or social network activities, I have studied why it is that digital media platforms are resoundingly characterized as neutral technologies in the public domain and often, unfortunately, in academia. But when we encounter problems, we have short-sighted responses. Instead, stories of glitches found in systems um, suggest that, uh, uh, that, the, that um, everything is working perfectly fine except for a temporary moment when, um, when there's a problem. And um, these glitches, this notion of glitches in the system really um, mask the organizing logics of the web, which I argue are broken in many spaces. Um, and so here's an example of um, a, a story that went viral uh, last summer. Um, DeRay McKesson, who's a well-known Twitter personality, um, tweeted out, if you Google map the N-word house, this is what you'll find, America. And what was happening is if you were typing, um, you know, nigger house or nigger king into Google Maps, it would take you to the White House. And so um, the Washington Post, as well as a number of uh, media outlets, picked up this story, and they went to Google and they asked for a response. And um, <clears throat> Google says, some inappropriate re results are surfacing in Google Maps that should not be. We apologize for any offense this may have caused. I tell my husband that if he tells me, um, I apologize if you're offended, or I apologize if you make me mad, that's not actually an apology. Um, <clears throat> so Google spokesperson tells US News in an email from Tuesday, our teams are working to fix this issue quickly. Now this is very typical of what happens when there's some type of glitch to the system, that it's responded um, by, from tech companies, not just Google, as um, a momentary uh, glitch in the system, really um, um, without challenge to the notion that um, these systems are not, in fact, running perfectly otherwise. And this is one of the things that I think we, uh, uh, we need to, to be thinking about. And I collected many, many examples, um, and I'm just gonna share a few of these. So here's another example. This is Kabir Ali. Um, he has his friends video him. This is another story that went viral. You can read about it um, in USA Today. Um, this is from June 9th, 2016. He has his friends um, uh, record him, digitally record him, where he's doing a Google image search on three black teens. And he tweets out, yo, look at this, um, because when you search for three black teens at that time, um, you would get uh, almost exclusively mugshots of black teenagers. And then he says to um, the camera, now let's see what happens when I just change one word and I change black to white. And what happens then is he gets these pictures, these kind of Getty stock photo images of three white teens who are um, apparently playing multiple sports at one time because they've got a lot of different balls going, I don't know. Um, and so this is the image that uh, is portrayed, right, as a kind of narrative or a discourse about what three black teens represent versus three white teens. And Jessica Gunn, um, who writes for USA Today, did a really um, excellent, she's a great tech reporter and I would follow her um, work closely. She's doing a great job. Um, she picked this up. And so uh, the next day, um, Twitter's Bob's Burger guy, um, notices that Google has quietly changed the algorithm and um, uh, now it's inserted um, an image of a defendant. This is um, interesting. The, the photo there of the young white man in court was actually a man who was, a young man who was convicted of a hate crime of murdering an African-American man. So it was an interesting choice um, to add. And then they've added a few kind of uh, 
uh, different images there on the third row of African American teens, right? So this again, this kind of below the radar um, acknowledgement that something isn't working right and um, the quiet fix. Here's another story that went viral. Um, Google searches on unprofessional hairstyles for work all featured black women with natural hair. Um, while if you did a search on professional hairstyles for work, they were all white women with updos, which I think is an important factor for all the white women here, that it's the updo that makes you more professional, apparently, in Google image search. So this is a notion here of, um, of what does it mean to um, characterize, and these are the kinds of things that I often will have my students um, collect searches on all kinds, and this is, these are great kind of um, exercises that you can also do when you're thinking about the design of your own projects, right, is this um, imagining all types of users, in this case, thank you so much, um, in this case, uh, there's so many, in fact, there's just more than I can, uh, can, can give you this morning. Um, of these, these kinds of um, mishaps, who, who, at whose expense do they come? And these are some of the questions that I have. Now, I started uh, first, um, I'm gonna read some of these to you because I know they're hard to read. So I first started collecting searches back in 2009. Um, in 2009, I was talking with a colleague, Andre Brock, from the University of Michigan, and we're just, uh, I was telling him that I had been um, doing a lot of kind of um, Google searching and finding troubling results, and I wanted to write about this, and, and he just kind of said offhand, oh, you should see what happens when you search for black girls, and so, of course, I immediately started searching for black girls. Now, in 2009, the first search, you know, I was a black girl when I was a girl, and I have a daughter, at the time she was a tween, and uh, I have lots of nieces, they're all black girls, and so I care very much about what black girls are doing on the internet. Um, at the time, in 2009, the first result for, on those keywords, black girls, was hotblackpussy.com. And this is just with moderate, this is with the standard settings. I told you guys that this was a talk that's too early for the morning, okay? I'm gonna say pussy a bunch of times right now too, okay? So just roll with it and then you can figure it out on the break. Um, by 2011, hotblackpussy.com was out of business, replaced by sugaryblackpussy.com, all right? So you here you have, um, a series of search results. This was taken in 2011. Um, it's followed by Black Girls, the UK band of white guys who've named themselves. Has anyone, anyone here ever heard of the Black, guy, the black Girls? Okay, so it's one person that I can see so far. They are excellent at search op engine optimization, terrible at promoting their music. No one ever knows who they are. Um, okay, so the Black Girls uh, band is the second, um, followed by two black girls um, love cock, I think is um, what that is, um, black, followed by black girls, big booty black girls, which is another porn site, followed by black girls, 100%, black girls um, uh, uh, chat, which is also a kind of a gateway to a porn site, black girls, the band, their Facebook page, again, winning at SEO, um, followed by, um, another porn site, and then a blog. Okay, so for many years, this is the way that black girls were represented on, in, a, in a standard Google search, if you, and we had many people, I had many people when I was doing this, collecting searches on black girls from different locations and different types of networks. Um, it's, it's interesting, when, whenever I'm getting, giving this talk, people always get out their phones or their laptops and they start like searching on all kinds of um, terms. I gave this talk once at the, um, Harvard Library and um, the university library and the head librarian for Harvard, she was in the back on her phone searching and she looked up um, something like um, middle-aged women, um, uh, something along those lines, middle-aged women, and it also had plenty of porn and so she was horrified and so we got a good laugh cry out of that. Um, I first wrote about this now in, uh, in 2012, I wrote a piece for Bitch Magazine, and you know, at the time, I was really trying to communicate, kind of do 
uh, critical media literacy, digital media literacy for black women. I wanted to write about this uh, for Essence Magazine. Essence Magazine is a magazine that caters to black women and women of color. But you have to be a famous per writer to get to write for Essence, and, and I wasn't. And so, um, Bitch Magazine, which is a kind of a feminist magazine that critiques popular culture, they were doing a special issue on cyberspace, and I couldn't really tell them, we don't really say cyberspace anymore, it's 2012, but I, it was cool. I just was like, let me write this piece. And um, they said, no, this, there's no story here. Everybody knows when you search for girls, you get porn. And I was like, do they? And is it, oh, we don't, we don't want to critique that in the feminist magazine. Um, we're just going to let that stand. And they were like, yeah. And so I'm very persistent. You know, my first career was in advertising and marketing before I became an academic. And so I, I know how to just bulldog it. And so I just kept going. I kept going. I had like several exchanges with them. And finally, I said, okay, well, before you, know, before you really decide you want to say no, um, even though you've said no five times, um, before you, you say it, uh, do a Google search on women's magazines and let me know if Bitch Magazine shows up in the first five pages. Because of course we know that what happens on the first page of real estate in a Google search is the most important. People who study um, information seeking behavior on the web um, find that the, the vast majority of people don't go past the first page of search results. So that first page of, re of real estate in Google is incredibly important. And so they, about 10 minutes later, they wrote back and said, okay, you can write the story. And so I did, and I talked about the ways in which women are sexualized in search results <clears throat> and why we might keep a closer eye on that, particularly, again, when um, search results are not particularly posited as um, advertising platforms. They're, they're really framed up in public discourse as public information portals. And I think that's really the important distinction that I want to make, is that what, happen, what happens in an advertising context is quite different from what happens when people believe that it's a public um, resource and, and the public good. And I wrote about that later for um, a journal. Now, G Google's misrepresentations of Asian and Latina girls, um, also problematic. Um, this is so far away, it's never so far away from me, I have bad eyes, but you can see here that um, uh, the top results for Asian women almost exclusively are all about um, Asian dating and gateway sites to um, porn, to porn um, as well as um, for Latinas, Hot Latinas, Hot Latinas, a complex magazine, again, these types of narratives. So let's go beyond um, search results because this is what, when I'm talking about this, we're talking at the level of kind of problematic representations. And representations are something that media scholars have cared about for a long time in terms of television and film. I care about it in terms of the web. Others are writing about it in terms of the web. Um, but now I wanna um, uh, take, us, take us to the next step. And here we have what happens when people um, articulate that they're using the web and using um, Google search in particular to make meaning out of their lives or their experiences. And here we have the case of Dylan Stormroof. Now, on the evening of June 17th, 2015, in Charleston, South Carolina, a 21-year-old white nationalist, Dylan Stormroof, opened fire on an unsuspecting African-American um, group of Christian worshipers at Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in one of the most heinous and um, racial and religious hate crimes of recent memory. The location of the murders was not chosen in vain by Roof. It stood as one of the oldest symbols of African American freedom in the United States. Emanuel AME was organized by free and enslaved black and African people in 1791 where its membership grew into the thousands only to be burned down in 1822 by white South Carolinians who heard that church member Denmark Vesey was leading an effort to organize enslaved blacks to revolt against their slave masters. For over 200 years, the Emanuel AME Church has been a site and symbol of a struggle for freedom from white supremacy and a place where organizing for civil rights and full participation of African Americans has been foregrounded by its members and supporters from across the country. Um, so right after Dylan Roof um, uh, committed this murder, of course, most of us were online 
trying to figure out who was this Dylan Roof person. Um, and uh, within about 24 hours, someone on Twitter found Dylan Roof's alleged manifesto, his online diary, which the FBI later authenticated was his um, at the lastrhodesian.com. And so many of us were kind of pouring through and I immediately wrote a chapter um, for the book about Dylan um, Roof Storm, uh, Storm Roof. So here's um, what Dylan says. He says, quote, this is a portion of his, his diary. He says, the event that truly awakened me was a Trayvon Martin case. I kept hearing and seeing his name and eventually I decided to look him up. I read the Wikipedia article and right away I was unable to understand what the big deal was. It was obvious that Zimmerman was in the right. But more importantly, this prompted me to type in the words black on white crime into Google and I have never been the same since that day. The first website I came to was the Council of Conservative Citizens. There were pages upon page, pages of these brutal black on white murders. I was in disbelief. At this moment, I realized that something was very wrong. How could the news be blowing up the Trayvon Martin case while hundreds of these black on white murders got ignored? From this point, I researched deeper and found out what was happening in Europe. I saw that the same things were happening in England and France and in all of the other Western European countries. Again, I found myself in disbelief. As an American, we are taught to accept living in the melting pot and black and other minorities have just as much right to be here as we do, since we are all immigrants. Not exactly. But Europe is the homeland of white people and in many ways the situation is even worse there. From here I found out about the Jewish problem and other issues facing our race and I can say today that I am completely racially aware. Now, according to the manifesto that re was reported in the news, Dylan Roof allegedly typed black on white crime in a Google search to make sense of the news reporting on Trayvon Martin, a young African-American teenager who was killed and whose killer, George Zimmerman, was acquitted of murder. What Roof found was information that confirmed a patently false notion that black violence on white Americans is an American crisis. What is compelling about the alleged information Roof found to make sense of his emerging racial attitude is how his search terms did not lead him to Federal Bureau of Investigation or FBI crime statistic, statistics on violence in the United States, which point to how crime against white Americans is largely an intra-racial phenomenon. Most violence against white Americans is committed by white Americans, as is most violence against African Americans largely committed by other African Americans. Violent crime is largely a matter of perpetration by proximity to those who are demographically similar to the victim. Homicides across racial lines do not nearly happen in the ways that white supremacist organizations purport. A search on the phrase black on white crimes does not lead to any experts on race, nor to any universities, libraries, books, or articles about the history of race in the United States. It does not point to any information to dispel the stereotype purported by white supremacist organizations. It's critical that we think about the implications of people who are attempting to vet information in the news media about race and race relations and who are led to fascist, conservative, anti-black, anti-Jewish, and or other white supremacist websites. Of course, if you know anything about the Council of Conservative Citizens, they're really like um, the corollary to the white citizens councils of the past. So when you uh, were a, a city council person or the mayor or a university professor, um, you couldn't be in the KKK because that was too, uh, too, too graphic and too violent. And so you instead joined the White Citizens Council and the Council on Conservative Citizens might be like the online corollary to the White Citizens Council. Um, uh, 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 it's an or a hate crime uh, organization that's uh, uh, tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, uh, who characterizes them as kind of, kind of vehemently racist. So I'm suggesting here that the power of search engines to lead people to a breadth and depth of information cannot be more powerfully illustrated than by looking at Dylan Roof's own alleged words about using Google to find information about the Trayvon Martin murder. And you know, I was writing, uh, I, I've been talking about this for um, a few years now and writing about it. And uh, <clears throat> it's been interesting to give this talk and talk about my work kind of post, 
the last presidential election, where now words like, um, phrases like fake news are bandied about, and I think to myself that, you know, no one really cared about misinformation on the web or misrepresentative information in um, Google searches until it threw a presidential election. And so I think as these are the kinds of things that we might um, want to care about before we have um, the most extreme, and I certainly would characterize this, this um, example of Dylan Roof as a more extreme example, um, while others might characterize, I guess, the presidential election as extreme too. Um, so this is where I talk about these things in case you're interested. <clears throat> now, in closing, let me just say that the politics of technologies really extend beyond um, software and platforms like Google. And I could, you know, I pick on Google because why not? Um, I mean, I, I, I study Google because it's really the largest information broker. If you don't know where something is on the web, you're really reliant upon an information broker like a search engine to help you find it. And so, um, so I care about that um, very much. But I also have been writing and thinking about um, the politics of our rush to um, digitize everything and solve problems and think about the world strictly through a digital frame. And so um, I, I co-wrote co a book, um, a, a series, a collection of, um, of essays by great scholars called The Internet, uh, Intersectional Internet. And <clears throat> Um, one of the things that I learned while writing and uh, organizing that book is that really um, we need to make more global intersectional linkages to our knowledge production and our management concerns. And this, I would say, is where my research is now moving uh, more in this global t context. Part of what um, I think we're uh, trying to investigate, both in this book and in future research, is um, the expansion of the commercial sector, often buttressed by overinvestment in digital technologies, which ultimately serve as a site of profit from uneven labor distribution throughout the networked economy. For example, some workers, including child and forced laborers in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, are mining ore called um, column by tantalite, um, which is abbreviated as Colton, to provide the raw materials for companies such as Nokia, Intel, Sony, and Ericsson, um, and now Google's in the micro um, chip, uh, microprocessor chip business too. Um, and they're mining these minerals in the production of components um, such as um, tantalum capacitors that are used in microprocessor chips for computer hardware like phones and computers. Now, communications scholar Robert Mejia in 2016 has critiqued the multiple ways in which electronics and communications devices and infrastructures have material consequences that have potent environmental impact too. He notes that, quote, it's imperative that media and cultural studies scholars offer an account of how the 3.7 million gallons of water used per day by Intel in Hillsboro, Oregon, and the millions more used elsewhere contribute to an, an ecology hospitable to infectious disease and its natural reservoirs. Knowing that an estimated 632,000 pounds of mercury were disposed of in the United States landfills between 1997 and 2007 from just discarded personal computers alone, and that about 130 million cell phones are thrown away each year. So this then is my brief attempt to speak to the breadth of concerns that I'm taking up in my research. And I'd like to leave us with a few thoughts on how we could reframe our work and collaborate um, together in the future. And I do think that while you know, I'm an academic doing academic work, I, my work is not meaningful unless I'm engaging with, with you all and people who are working in technology and working around design. I have computer science and engineering students often in my classes and you know, I'll say things to them like, um, okay, you know, now that you kind of understand the values that are embedded in technologies, design this where no one dies where it doesn't poison the environment. You want a hard design challenge? Try that. It's, it is difficult. I know the things that I'm suggesting are incredibly difficult, but they're not impossible because, in fact, I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have this. So we invented this from a particular imagination, and I think that we can imagine a different type of digital um, technology design. 
So here's a few things we can learn from our digital failures. One, I think we have to reject the notions of neutrality, that our fields are neutral, that our projects are neutral, that our technologies are neutral. Um, but in fact, um, I've tried to show you some different dimensions that you may not have been as familiar with about the politics, the very deeply political nature um, of uh, the, the products and the projects we're engaged with. I think it's okay to embrace critical perspectives. Why not think about who, who benefits from this, who loses, what are the power dynamics of the projects that we're engaging with? And I think also paying attention to commercially biased information. When advertising revenue really is um, fundamentally driving the um, development of products, to what degree does that change the nature of the product itself? I think we also have to stay in action around kind of resisting black, um, black box technologies. Um, obviously, if we had algorithms that were visible, that were not proprietary, we might be able to um, imagine alternatives. I'm really interested in working with programmers and designers who want to think about public interest search and how we might, again, it's not that we need to make the companies that exist something else, but maybe we could imagine alternatives that are in the public interest. Um, they're not gonna probably make us into millionaires and billionaires, so we'll have to keep our day jobs while we work on that. Um, I think also thinking about technology over development and e-waste, those things that I shared with you about Robert Mejia's work around the kind of ecological and environmental disaster and the human um, catastrophes that are happening around the world where our fields are directly implicated. And you know, it's so easy for us because we're in comfortable spaces doing our work where we don't really have to think about um, the loss of life and the waste. Um, uh, huge toxic e-waste cities now emerging on the west coast of Africa um, where our, our uh, digital waste go and, um, and of course in China. And then I think um, making technology design visible and maybe intervenable, I don't even know if that's a word, I made that up, but it could, can we intervene upon um, the design of technologies and help the public understand um, more readily how, um, how we can use credible information to bolster our democracy. In the end, I really think that these are, this is about the project of democracy that really um, expands access and opportunity and inclusion for everyone in our society and doesn't just ultimately um, uh, center profit uh, before all else. So um, thank you for your time and attention this morning. I really appreciate it.